I went to the doctor a few weeks ago in LA. Something told me don't wait until um, I get back from New York, which would be in the fall. And they did some routine tests that became not routine. Uh, they started to, uh, this is bladder stuff, so you can imagine how you look inside the bladder. And the doctor saw this pinkish spot inside what's called the diverticulum in my bladder, and uh, he seemed upset about it. And he called in another doctor, and the other doctor got upset. And they said, uh, the word that we all, everybody doesn't like to hear in America, you know, and probably everywhere else, called cancer. And when you hear that word and you start to, you start to experience this, uh, the, the weight, uh, just, just smash that. <laughs> okay, just toss it out. Okay. Um, what happens with the word, with that word, is that, um, The cultural references are very strong, and they come up in a very in a very big way. And they both decided that they did not want to do a biopsy of it because the biopsy risked the tearing of the wall of the diverticulum, which is very thin, and therefore could possibly uh, create a spillage, which which you don't want. So they did a test of the urine, and the urine test came back negative. But I had decided that it might be a very good idea to just stay in Los Angeles, get this diverticulum removed, and, uh, and then go from there. Uh, and it was all very heated and very quick and very panicky, like we should do something very quickly. And, uh, and then I just essentially, <laughs> one, took a deep breath and listened to the advice of my wife and a number of very trusted friends and and they basically said uh, don't go too fast and I have a very good doctor in New York that I've seen before and so I decided to go back to New York carry on as normal see this doctor and get a second opinion if you will which I did uh, about a week and a half ago and the second opinion was really was really interesting. They they looked at this and they said, uh huh, it's very suspicious. And they decided to to do a biopsy. This doctor who I love very much just was very. He kept going, yes, no, yes, no. He said, do it. And they and they pulled this thing out and they looked at it and they called me on Wednesday this week and said, yes, in fact, it is cancerous. And so we're going to, we, I'm going to have an operation on the 8th of, uh, of May. I'll tell you why I'm talking about this, not because I, I certainly don't want this to be about sympathy and I don't want this to be about your being concerned because basically I'm not concerned. They all, they all said they think this is caught very early, that it's an early stage cancer. There's a lot of positivity going on about it, but here's what's important. I don't have cancer. This body has it. And I am finding the most amazing experience in going through this. It, a truly, truly remarkable experience. The first thing that happened was the drive home from the, uh, the doctor in Los Angeles. The drive home by myself, uh, thinking this may be, <laughs> at that point, the end of this particular life. <coughs> started to create all of the images that you can all imagine. What will I miss here? What do I not want to leave? And what will the world be like without me in it? <laughs> Which is a very interesting experience. And, and what it all came down to rather simply, and I suspect you'll all second guess me, is my granddaughter was very, very high on the list. Because I know everybody else's story. I know all of your stories, and I know kind of where you've come, where you've gone, to the degree that stories are important, I can articulate to myself where you're probably going to end up, <laughs> which is probably where I'm going to end up, 
are all going to the same place. But my granddaughter is really new to all this. I hate to miss the story. I hate to miss the journey, honestly. And that, for me, was really complicated. <coughs> and it reminded me, and I gave a talk about this a couple of weeks ago in Los Angeles, about uh, saying goodbye to my grandmother when I was four years old. And I, that experience for me was overwhelmingly powerful. I didn't know she was dying, I had no idea, but I knew the hug that she gave me when I hugged her was the hug of a lifetime, really. She hugged me with such beauty and such completeness. And I, I described it in that class as a kind of transmission. It's like she emptied her heart into me. And I think at this point I'm emptying my, her heart into you. That's pretty much what's going on here. She gave me this unbelievable gift. But then I tried to think about this from her side. What was it like for her saying goodbye to this grandchild that she would not get to watch grow up, that whose story she would never hear? And that was overwhelming for me, the sadness of that, the power of that, the beauty of letting go of the thing you love. It's so overwhelming. And then what started to happen was I started to look around me at how much I loved. And, it's, you know, so it's, it's the greatest of cliches when you think you're going to be leaving here, you start to see it. You start to see it in ways that you really have never seen it before. I mean, you discover how much you love life. I mean, we all discover every, every so often how much we love life, but nothing makes you love it more than thinking, well, this is it. <laughs> this may well be the final final whatever, you know, you know, weeks, months, whatever you, it could be. And that love, <coughs> excuse me, was so beautiful, is so beautiful, honestly. It's not, it hasn't dissipated for a second. And it changes things. It changes what you want to do with your day. How you want to be. And you kind of don't want to do anything particularly new or different or special. You just want to do whatever kind of arises in the day. And of course, one of the things I've been learning over the course of the last few years is life just comes. It just arises and you either greet it or fight it, depending upon your nature or your involvement, your egotistical involvement with all that stuff. But when your ego is not really deeply involved, you just sort of go sit back and go, wow. You watch the day fill itself. And it does. It just fills itself. Messages come through the internet. You all know about that. The phone rings. The newspaper comes. Uh, you know, you eat a bowl of cereal. The bananas are perfect. Um, you look out the window, you know, and it's like f stormy. And part of you goes, wow, stormy. <laughs> and you just start to take on everything so profoundly, so, so deeply. And what you discover in this idea that you have the C word is that you don't have it. it it's, you're completely free in the midst of this. You're completely free. And Yes, you get caught emotionally. Yes, things happen. You know, you hug each other more. So much, so much goes on that has such such beauty in it, and 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 all the annoyances are still there. You know, I mean, it's got everything. Everything is life. Life is so vibrantly present, and the gift of possibly leaving the world, and again, I don't know that that's kind of exactly what's in store right at the moment, but it will be. It will be. If it's not on this particular ride, it will be one coming down the road, and it will not just be me who's going to go on that ride. There's nobody in this room who's not going to go on that ride, who's not going to have the exact same series of experiences, except if you haven't found your way to yourself, the C word is pretty, pretty horrifying. Because 
It throws a deadline at you. It makes you see how much work isn't done, how much work remains, or it just frightens you because <coughs> you don't even know that there's work in the world. So many people have no idea that there's anything to be done here. But every one of us has been recipients of this enormous gift that if we can sit still long enough and quietly enough, we find this place of exquisite presence. And it's full of joy. It's full of beauty. It's full of appreciation, gratitude, awareness. And what's so interesting about it is that it's in that constant state even when terrible news is delivered. You can still access that. You still go in. You just knock on the door and you it welcomes you. And I have no reason to think it won't continue to welcome me, no matter what, really, no matter what goes on. So, <coughs> excuse me, I debated sharing this with you. I've held off for the last few weeks because I just thought, let me see where it's headed and what it's about. And, and then I thought, you know, do you really need to know this? But I've been pretty open about all the journey of my life, and I figure, this is, this is a note that we're all going to hit somewhere along the way. Every one of us gets to um, arrive at that moment, whether it is a doctor suddenly, unexpectedly saying something to you, or you know, a car coming at you at 90 miles an hour and you can't get out of the way, or whatever it is, there's this moment where you either have a place of refuge that sustains, illuminates, frees you, or you don't. And when Rudy said on day one that if I do this work I have to do it for the rest of my life, I had no hesitation in saying yes to that. And the gratitude <coughs> excuse me, that I feel at this moment for having said yes is enormous because it allows me to look at something that I think most people think of as very dark and very, um, very much a loss and not see it in, that, in those terms. I mean, honestly, you know, Talia, <laughs> my granddaughter, leaving her behind is probably the most painful thing I can think of. On the other hand, all I have to do is think of her. All I have to do is think of her. And I have in instant access to my own inner being. So in a way she's a ticket to <laughs> instantaneous clarity and love, which is wonderful. But you also have to leave it behind. And one of the things I understood, and it's really been very important, I want to leave this world totally in love with it. I don't want to leave this world angry at it. I don't want to leave this world um, feeling incomplete. I don't want to leave this world betrayed by the idea of dying, which I think a lot of people do, which is crazy since we're told about it pretty early on. You know, I want to leave this world totally in love with this world. And that's exactly how I feel. Not that I'm necessarily leaving, but I may be. And I and ultimately will be. And so will you. And so this lesson that's coming through for me is love it. Love it. Don't, <laughs> don't wait to love life. You know? And I've been pretty good about that because I've been very blessed on so many levels. And my heart has been open for much of my life. And you know, and Rudy really taught me the muscle of that opening, and he really taught me how <coughs> how to share that love, and how to share presence, and how to share, you know, this depth of being, which is an enormous gift. But I think the great thing about knowing your mortality 
is that it encourages you, I hope, a little bit more to do the work. The work. What's the work? The work is sitting and finding this place of refuge. That's the work. And it's the most meaningful work there is, really. Why would you not want to do that? Why would you not want to have a place that you can go to at any moment in time and just be brought in and comforted just like you are when you get a boo-boo on your elbow and your mother hugs you? You know? Why wouldn't you want that? That's the craziness, you know? Part of it is ignorance. Part of it is most people don't know that it's available. They don't, they don't know. Our culture doesn't teach us that really very well. <clears throat> Some religions teach us to pray, which is kind of a doorway to that. <clears throat> it's a kind of asking, asking. And a lot of religion talks about receiving, but it doesn't exactly tell you what's received. But what you, what you really, really want, what you really deeply want in life, is to have this truth reveal itself to you. There are different stages of that revelation. One of those stages is that you sit down, you take a breath, you ask for help to surrender, and you actually do it. And there's a kind of like, oh my God, that worked. This thing works. There's actually a place inside that goes... And then there's a deeper version of that where you can just go into your heart and it just opens and it kind of stays open. And you can get an hour of this incredible opening. And you can get a week of it or you can get a month or a few months of it. And there will be constant moments where you'll think, ah, I've finally done it. I've finally arrived. And then, then, you, then you lose access again. Then you forget how you did it. Then you have to actually work harder or work differently to get to that place. That's the practice that Rudy gave us. Everyone here has had their moments, 10 seconds or 10 days or weeks, of how to live. How to live life in flow, in gratitude, in joy, in openness, in availability, in forgiveness, in allowing, in connectivity. That's all of what arrives from doing this practice. It's a good thing. I would rather have that than not have those things. Than have, you know, anger and hostility and betrayal and depression and all that other stuff. Why wouldn't you opt for this? It just makes sense to me. Then there's another stage, which I've been talking about for the last few years, which I call awakening, which is where the seeking ego mind trying to get this thing, falls away. And what you find is that all that's there is this open, forgiving, loving, honoring, grateful entity. And in the beginning of that experience, you <clears throat> it's a little bit like in the practice we do. You can get a week or two or a month or four months of that experience, and then even that becomes what I've referred to often as the state of okayness. It's no longer peak experience. It's just what is. It's just being. It's just this. It's this long journey to just arrive at where you are. And arriving at where you are is a realization that everything around you is you. That there is no separate aspect of your body and it. It's all one story. It's all one manifestation. It's all one occurrence. So when the flickering starts to happen in your own private life, in your own sense of bodily existence, and you do what you've been doing for years of practice, which is to go inside and just go What exactly will flicker out? Well, what will flicker out is this manifestation. This manifestation, probably. But this place inside, this place of 
unitive knowing of oneness, of God consciousness, of being aware that you are looking at God 24 hours a day. This sense that everything you see, feel, touch, smell, consume, or fear is only one thing, and it's God. That's all this is. Everyone wonders, where is God? You are staring at it in the face. And I don't mean just this face. Each of your faces. There's a difference between people who know that and don't know that. And it's a behavioral thing. People who know it are really... They have a light about them. You want to hug them. You want to talk with them. You want to spend time with them. People who are awakened <coughs> or illuminated, in many cases, speak truth in a way that other people don't. They're honest with you. And I don't want to make this across the board because I've met awakened people who are horrible <laughs> and, and difficult personalities and not necessarily someone you want to spend time with exactly, but you know when you're with them, truth is happening. What we're all doing, what we're all doing is trying to pull back the blinders and see what's in front of us for the holy, divine truth of what it is. And what I do now, in the last three weeks particularly, is I walk around and I just see so many people stumbling through their lives, so many people not getting it on so many levels. And the sorrow of that is powerful. It's powerful. You just want to go to people. Just go, please, just stop for a second. Just look. Just look. Look at what it is. Look at the opportunity for joy. Look at the opportunity for love. Look at the opportunity to just, in the great cliche, wake up and smell the flowers. You know, Look at it. Look at the sky. All that stuff which for me has been going on since the awakening in a very big way. But I have to say this amps it up. It really amps it up. The idea that this is the last time maybe. You just live differently. And you've heard this from the beginning in songs, you know, you hear it in theater and movies, you know, live for today, you know, seize the moment. This is it. This is it. You know? It doesn't necessarily happen again. This is the time. This is, this is the creation that you have found in your being. This particular one. Why? Why? Who knows? How has it happened? Who knows? Mystery of mysteries. And you're in it. And you are of it. And you are, in many ways, the creator of it. This is all of the stuff that comes to you, if you're lucky, when you finally know that there is a <laughs> an end point. So this has been an extraordinary ride for me. <coughs> and, <coughs> you know, it's been a, the last however many months since I went back to <laughs> L.A. You know, I, those of you who've listened to any of the talks, you know that I tore rotator cuffs in my shoulders and I haven't been sleeping and... You know, it's been a really, really uncomfortable period. I mean, really uncomfortable beyond belief. Pain and <laughs> dealing with pain pills that don't work or that make you psychotic that I don't want to do. Trying to enter into pain rather than run from it. This has been the dialogue of the last five or six months for me. And all I can tell you <laughs> is it's uncomfortable and it makes you unbelievably empathetic with every other person, because what you see is that when you look at people, they're all suffering. Everybody's suffering. Not in the same degree, but they will be. Pain, pain, unfortunately, is an inevitability in life. And I'm hitting the inevitability. And I'm trying to find a way to live with it and deal with it and learn from it. And I will tell you something Rudy said many years ago, which never, ever registered for me. It was the hardest line I ever heard. He said, pain is God's love. And boy, is that a tricky line. But if you really can see where pain takes you, 
if you can enter the pain rather than avoid it, if you can take this lesson on, because it's a big lesson, you will grow like mad. You will grow and grow. It will deepen you, it will expand you, you will become a true human being. You will get what this journey is. You will get it without having to <clears throat> hide from it, drug yourself out of it, drink yourself out of it, smoke yourself out of it, whatever it is <coughs> that you've been doing to not taste this, taste it. Live it in all of its glorious discomfort. And you will really find, at least that's my experience, that even the discomforts are because you're alive. You're alive in it. You're really here. You're really here. The pain is real. You're really experiencing something remarkable. And it's the human journey. It's not just you. Every single human being goes through this. And one of the things I keep wanting to say to people as I watch them going through the craziness of their day is, this doesn't last. Your entire career doesn't mean anything in the end. All the stuff you've achieved doesn't mean anything. It was just busyness. It just kept you here. It's fine not to diminish careers and achievement and all of that stuff. But in the end, it's just you and your pain, if you want to call it that. But let's call it you and God's love. in very strange form. What do you do with that? What do you do with that? Well, that's the difference between what you might call the saints and the sinners. You know, how you decide to deal with that pain, how you decide to deal with, with truth. The fact that everything you have will be taken. Everything you've built will be dismantled. Everything that was meaningful, meaningful to you will not continue to exist. But the truth is, it did exist. You had the ride. You touched it. You lived it. You breathed it. You smelled it. You embraced it. You hugged it. You slept with it. That's the incredible thing about life. That you had this journey. And it's a journey that passes. And because it passes, it has such profound relevance. You know, if it was here all day long and you thought it was going to be here forever, you would never appreciate it. You wouldn't. It would make no sense to you. And unfortunately, that's how most people live. They don't appreciate it because, as far as most minds know, it's forever. And it may well be forever, but not in the way we experience or know it. You're not going to get another journey with this body. The same people that you know here will not be in your life again in the same body. You know, I have a relationship with a certain number of people in my life, and I know I knew them before. I, knew, I know this is not the first time that I'm encountering them. They've got different bodies and different forms, but I, they're so familiar to me. From the minute they walk in the door, I go, aha, uh -huh, they're back. For good or for, for ill. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> there really, there are people you haven't finished stuff with that you've got, to, you've got unfinished, you know, unfinished business. And then there are people who come in and you go, oh my God, I've been waiting. And it's wonderful. It's really wonderful. And I have to say, since I met Rudy, so many of the people that appeared through Rudy's class and in my teaching are those people. We've all been around the block together before. We've had different forms and different incarnations, and some of you were my teacher, and then I was your teacher, and <coughs> you know we were lovers and we were enemies, and we were all of these different things going around the block. But we've all been on this ride, and uh, you know it's the ride. And I don't even know if I believe in reincarnation. I just know that in life it just keeps happening in so many different forms, and you know whether your personal life comes back, maybe, you know, but. But what I do know is that it appears to return to this. And this is the thing we've been seeking our entire life. You actually return to the very thing you've been looking for. Of course, many people are looking for it in the wrong way. If you're looking for this in a relationship, it's not going to last. If you're looking for this in a grandchild, it's not going to last. 
If you're looking for it in a piece of chocolate cake, you already know that's not going to last. Mm -hmm. You know, it's going to come and it's going to disappear. If you're looking for it inwardly, the space that is the acknowledger of the joy from outside, the space that is really that which appreciates and knows and has gratitude, if you know it from that space inwardly, you have it. You have it. There's nowhere to go. Everything that happens outside is just bonus. It's just an extraordinary gift. It has its ups and downs, but it's an experience of, it's so worth it. I mean, one of, the, one of the things I really understood was, would I have gone through all the pain and all the suffering of life to meet my wife, to meet my children, and to meet my grandchild? The answer is, of course. Of course. And I would have done it to meet you guys. And really, I love you guys so much. You have no idea. You have no idea. I just, there's so much love. And all I can tell you is that love comes because Rudy taught me to open my heart to what's in front of me. What's in front of me is what I love. And you're all worth it. Every one of you. Every one of you is worth being loved. That's what's so incredible. I mean, everybody out here is worth being loved, the whole world. But... You know, you got to get a really big heart to pull that one off. <laughs> but, it's, but it's doable. It's doable. It's, we're, we're really, we're here, we're here to try. We're really here to try. So, I've, I've had this feeling for the last few months that I keep giving these valedictory talks, you know, kind of summing it up. Because I honestly have felt for a while that they're trying to take me out. And, uh, you know, and, that's, and they do. That's what they do. <laughs> they ultimately take you out. And, uh, and I, I've, you know, I'm ready to go, you know, I mean, sad as it may be in terms of, you know, getting to share a lot of stuff, I, I really am ready to go. And, uh, and you know, when, they, when they push the button, they'll push the button, and that will be that. And, you know, hopefully <laughs> you guys will, will um, you'll, you'll, be, you'll all become teachers. That's what I would love. You'll all become teachers. You'll all carry it on, you know? You'll just carry it on. And you don't even have to have a class. You can just walk through life being that. Being that vessel of love, being that vessel of compassion, that being that expresses gratitude and expresses forgiveness, that allows people to be who they are. It allows them to love their own life. You are already, the, you're, you, can do that, you can do that starting tomorrow. But the minute this particular teacher disappears, <coughs> others of you should sit here. Keep this going. You know, keep it alive. And you don't even have to sit here, like I'm saying. You, doesn't, you don't have to have a class. But the great thing about a class is the collective. The collective experience of oneness is so rare. It's so rare. You know, people live for it and rarely, rarely get it. And here we get it every week, you know, regularly or almost regularly. So, I guess what I'm saying is, I'm sharing the ride with you. This is where the ride is at the moment. I suspect I'm going to be around a good while. If that's not true, it's not a problem for me, <laughs> and hopefully not for you. If I am around, we'll continue this, hopefully. If I'm not around, you'll continue it, hopefully. And, uh, and we'll all have you know, a wonderful, wonderful experience of being manifested in a universe of extraordinary wonder and mystery. Because that's what we are. And all you have to do, all you have to do is know that. That's the whole purpose. Just know it. Go, wow, wow. Just once in a while. And if you're really lucky all day long, just go, wow. Because that's all it leads to. It doesn't lead to anything else. It doesn't lead to supernatural powers. You're not going to be Superman. <clears throat> you know, you're not going to have the perfect relationship with any human being. You're not going to, you're not, I mean, it's all going to be life. You know, it's all going to be yin-yang. No matter what you do, that's what it will be. Figure that out and go, oh, it's yin-yang. Some days are great and some are terrible. Some days it's stormy and rainy and you're caught in the middle of it. And some days are sunshine and gorgeous. And it's always going to be thus. Always. 
So accept that and life will be a great ride. Fight it and you'll be in the place of many people who want to you know, kill their neighbors and covet their wives and <coughs> do all sorts of things. You don't have to do that. You know, you don't have, you can live, you can live, you can live in the beauty of your existence and recognize it. So I can elaborate on this theme, but I don't sense it's going to go anywhere else. So um, thank you guys for coming. Uh, uh, next week, uh, Blanche will teach. I'm, I'm off to, uh, to to Cardiff, Cardiff, Wales tomorrow to uh, watch a new production of Ghost that's starting to tour around the United Kingdom. And I'm really excited to see a reincarnation of this show. And I'm just thrilled that it has life still. And uh, then it, they're doing another one in America that's going to start in Schenectady, which is just 90 minutes from here. So I'm going to get to go up there in August, if all goes well, and uh, watch that happening. And, uh, and then there's a lot more of that happening. So for me, it's just, you know, it's just nice things to rise up. And, uh, you know, life is good. So I, should I ask for questions? I don't know. If there's any questions? Jane? Mm -hmm. um, well, lately, just very lately, I, I, there's been a lot of anger like coming through me, and it's like, uh, you know, like it's about environmental stuff and drug companies and someone pushing me around the dance floor. <laughs> we talked about this. And um, I've never quite known how to deal with anger. You know, it just, it, it's, it's not yours. Yeah. If you personalize it, if you bring it into the Julia realm, mm -hmm. then, then you have to deal with the way people deal with anger. You experience emotion, it riles you up, it mm -hmm. goes into your head, you think about it, your system creates a lot of uh, sort of bile, a lot of things go on as a result of it, and <coughs> ultimately it passes, mm -hmm. and you have had your dance with it. Mm -hmm. Or you can just see it happening, not engage it, Watch it rise up like a thunderstorm when you're in the house. Uh -huh. You know, yeah. you just see it come in the sky, you look out, the thunder, boom, yeah. you're safe as can be, and then it's gone. You can do it that way. Yeah. Or you can run outside and risk that you'll be hit by lightning, <laughs> you know, which people seem to like to do. Yeah. And, you know, and then do that dance and see what happens. But anger is dangerous. Yeah. You know, it can hit in big ways. And, you know, but the human dance, it dances with all this stuff. And loves it. It loves it. It loves jumping off cliffs and, you know, and riding waves that are way too big for a person to ride. You know, people love that stuff, and the, and the world is here to let let us experience it. So go with it. If you want to be angry, be angry. You know, if you want to do the dance of anger, just say, okay, I want to do the dance of anger, mm -hmm. and get in it. Or even in the middle of it, say, wow, this wasn't a good dance, and stop. Yeah. Which is a thing that spiritual life gives you the capacity to do. You know, you can actually go, oh, not good. I'm p pulling back. Yeah. But, you know, not having a spiritual life, you're in the dance without any, um, without a partner, really, or with, with partners you don't know and who aren't kind to you. Yeah. And, uh, and you're going to be caught and ultimately left sitting on the side of the the room while other people dance. You know, the, dan the dance of life is um, ultimately a fairly lonely affair. Mm -hmm. So you've got to kind of learn how to dance with yourself. Mm -hmm. And you have to learn how to appreciate who you are and know that if nobody asks you to dance, you're going to be just as happy as if they do. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and if you want to dance with anger, then get in there and do it. And if you want to dance with beauty, then figure out how you do that. Mm -hmm. And if you want to skip the dance, stay home and watch TV. <laughs> <laughs> but then, be, like being, being true, like true to, like being true to, um, I guess being being true to it, so that maybe it can be used as fuel to, um, I mean, to maybe love even deeper, to. Um, no, if you, if you have consciousness, which mm -hmm. entering your own depth allows, then you, then you live your life passionately. Mm -hmm. 
with all that stuff with awareness. Just do it. You know, there's, there's no, the right and wrong thing is something you want to kind of put aside a little bit mm -hmm. and just go, I'm going to be cautious or I'm going to be incautious. I'm going to be totally available to what happens or I'm going to be careful. It's, it's, your, it's your call and it can be whatever you want it to be. You design the whole thing. You design. Certain stuff comes up and how you engage it is completely based on you. Most people engage life based on a desire for safety. The desire for safety inhibits almost everything we do. Yeah. Learning to give up safety doesn't mean that you're crazy. It just means take it on. Yeah. Live this life. Yeah. And I think most, most literature that we love says take a chance. You know? And you've been taking chances. And the anger is the thing that often comes up when you take a chance. But that's okay. Then be angry. You know, there's no rules. There's no rules. You know, it's your life. Anyone else? Okay, I'll be back in two weeks. And Blanche will be here next week. And I've said this before. You're lucky if you get a chance to sit with Blanche. Mm -hmm. <laughs>